they're looking for trouble, they're excited, right? They're looking for people, they know who they are. They know they're going to have a good old ruck with it. And they say, so what's the harm in it? They want to beat each other up, that's something they're doing. It's as simple. Police now recognise they've been containing the problem, not beating it. I'll be assessing their new strategy, which involves targeting the so-called generals who mastermind the worst acts of violence. Tonight, Public Eye examines the latest police initiative to beat the hooligan and asks, with the World Cup only four months away, can it provide a cure for the English disease? The sight of line upon line of policemen has become as much a part of the game as the insignia of the football fan. At Chelsea v Liverpool, 300 officers stood guard over 30,000 fans. Lord Justice Taylor writes, I know of no other sport or entertainment in a civilised country in which it is necessary to keep those attending from attacking each other. And the cost is enormous, £10 million a year in London alone. 90% of it at the taxpayer's expense. This is the English disease. Television carries the infection into our homes. At Heysel, the violence brought death. And the aggravation has moved beyond the ground into the streets with alcohol spurring the hooligans on. There's no simple explanation, as Lord Justice Taylor says, no single remedy for the disease. It's a potent mixture of tribalism, vandalism and ritual aggression. Indignation runs through just about every page in Lord Justice Taylor's report. Football is our national game, he says. We gave it to the world but its image in our country is much tarnished. Now, these words are based on first-hand experience. In the course of his inquiry, he visited 14 English grounds. One of them was Stamford Bridge, the home of Chelsea. His day at the match appalled him. He watched visiting supporters being escorted out of the ground where they'd been penned for 35 minutes while the Chelsea fans left. It was, he said, like a column of prisoners of war being marched and detained under guard. The police believe that only by segregating the fans can they keep the lid on the violence and prevent open confrontation. But Lord Justice Taylor says that keeping the fans apart only tends to increase and polarise their hostility. It's because crowd control in and around the ground is so tight that hooligans have sought other venues for their encounters. Mainline railway stations have become an alternative battleground, and that's why the police are there in force too. For many of the police allocated to a Chelsea home game, the day begins when the visiting fans arrive at Euston Station. They're monitored as they arrive at Fulham Broadway, the gateway to Chelsea's patch. By this time, Chelsea fans are already draining the pubs and getting ready for the afternoon's excitement. People don't understand. There are groups of people that want to fight each other. You fight your own groups. You don't go out and fill in little kids, old women, or whatever. Oh, it just gets them excited, you know what I mean? A bit of adrenaline running. But, uh, well, some people, it really does make their day, you know what I mean? So, the people that go and look for trouble, they're excited, right? They're looking for people, they know who they are. They know they're going to have a good old ruck with it. And they say, so what's the harm in it? Over Saturday lunchtime, one Chelsea pub served 3,000 pints. Pubs can be battlegrounds too, as one group of fans tries to take another's turf, frustrated by the enforced standoff inside the ground. That's why landlords too endeavour to enforce segregation. The police try to prevent fans drinking by channelling them straight to the ground. This causes still further resentment for visitors and home fans alike. You feel like an animal, you go away, you go on the train, you go out for a drink, you come out of the station, all they want to do is just put you in the ground. I work in the city, I'm, I'm one of the Thatchers, you know, as opposed to the youth, you know what I mean? I love it, you know? But on a Saturday, I go to football, I love my football, but I'm treated like a criminal, and, you know, just like, 
You've just got to do it. One of the 23 fans ejected from the match feels that he's been victimised too. We're shouting, come on, get up there. Because everyone else is sitting down and we're trying to will them on, we've been grabbed up, we've been taken out of the game, we've been taken our membership, so I mean, we're members. We're not, we're not hooligans at all. We've had our memberships taken away. And this just isn't on. Fans may complain about the treatment, but to the police, this is a volatile fixture with a high risk of violence and public disorder. The officer in charge believes he has no option. If I wish to go and watch a football match, and the option that was given to me was to go in under control into a football ground, under police supervision, or to be left to the elements, including the criminal elements, attached to all the clubs and who try to attach themselves to football to attack me, to use Stanley knives on me, to use various other weapons on me, then I think I would opt for the former and going under control. Can Chelsea supporters please cross the road at this point? Liverpool Judging by his report, Lord Justice Taylor clearly has considerable right. sympathy for the fans' complaints. Segregation, he says, merely controls the symptoms of hooliganism and does nothing to eliminate the disease. In fact, he suggests it may even have made it worse. Hold your tickets up as you come in for us to see, please. I think that um, the attitude that they're taking is to try and sort of suppress everybody um, and herd everybody along um, and it's, things aren't going to change really until they start to talk to people that they're affecting. Lord Justice Taylor accepts that there has to be another way and he's outlined an alternative strategy. Central to it is the use of police intelligence to outwit and outmanoeuvre the hooligan. Public Eyes reporter Martin Bashir has been exploring the secret world of these undercover operations. Wolverhampton Wanderers in the West Midlands has a prestigious past. The club's over a century old and was one of the founder members of the Football League. And throughout its history, the Wolves have enjoyed a large and loyal following. But until fairly recently, it attracted a crowd who were interested in anything but football. Wolves' first game of the 1987-88 season was away to Scarborough, who'd just been promoted to the Football League. What should have been a day of celebration for Scarborough was wrecked by Wolves fans, intent only on violence. Incredibly, only one fan was injured, but thousands of pounds worth of damage was caused and pictures of the violence were seen on national television. It was just the latest in a series of violent incidents involving Wolves fans. Police believe the hardcore troublemakers numbered about a hundred and were highly organised not only at away games. They'd meet at certain public houses and as visiting fans came into Wolverhampton they'd be waylaid and attacked and there was many instances of quite dreadful violence being perpetrated. Inside the ground they'd act again as a team They'd leave before the end of the game, of course, to waylay our fans again and create ambushes. Uh, the whole scenario was a disgrace. The hooligans justified the violence at Scarborough and elsewhere in an interview on local radio. The football team ain't doing nothing, so the hooligans have got to. Wolves ain't been on in the papers, right, except for when we went down to Scarborough and battered them. And that's the only time we got on the papers. So if the football team ain't doing nothing, so we've got to do it. Senior officers felt that increasing police numbers would not deal with the problem. Instead, they drew up a strategy to target the ringleaders. A decision was taken to launch an undercover operation called Operation Growth. Richard Shakespeare and Mark Pritchard were amongst eight officers who volunteered to go undercover in an attempt to infiltrate gangs. For three months, they lived on a knife edge, acting as soccer fans, but working as police officers. And it was the information that they supplied which enabled other officers to be on site with video cameras to record evidence, as on this occasion, when Cardiff fans met up with rival Wolves supporters. For public eye, PC's Shakespeare and Pritchard returned to the Wolves ground, having completed their most difficult professional assignment. There's no problem uh physical appearance but it's uh, the mental side which is a difficult part of it you've got to stop thinking like a policeman 
You've got to uh, stop talking like a policeman, which is very hard after you've done 10 years in the job. How dangerous did you find the job? It, it's as, as dangerous as you made it. Um, our brief was not to get into any trouble uh, with the police or otherwise. Uh, so as soon as we saw something coming about, you could see what was happening. You'd step to one side and watch. The police discovered that the hooligans compiled scrapbooks. They contained press reports cataloguing in detail their most violent incidents. They also had calling cards printed for the Bridge Boys gang. Fights were also carefully planned, both by Wolves fans and opposition supporters. When uh, Wolves played away at Exeter, uh, we were outside the ground and a home fan, whether he was an Exeter fan or not, he was obviously from that part of the, the country, came up to us and said, uh, if you want to knock, um, it's round the corner, I'll tell you where, and he gave us directions where to meet for the fight. Back at Wolverhampton Police Station, another team of officers were involved in a meticulous and strict process as they collated evidence. It was here that the real case against the Wolves fans was prepared, using the statements written up by the covert officers after each match. These were then entered into the computer as soon as possible and regularly discussed with the Crown Prosecution Service. As the evidence began to mount, officers limited the number of suspects to 100. But just as the operation was moving to a successful conclusion, it seemed that the officer's cover was about to be blown. The greatest problem is, like you say, someone coming up and saying, hello, Bridge, you're still in the police force. Um, there was one occasion when I uh, recognised somebody who would have done that and uh, I was with uh, Richard, and we uh, ducked and dived and went out the fire escape of the pub. Towards the end of the operation, uh, at a home fixture against Bolton, I was standing in the crowd, and uh, I was approached by two Wolves fans, who told me that I was uh, PC Shakespeare, I was a policeman, and uh, that I drank in certain pubs, which they also drank in. I uh, denied this, and uh, the men went away. Later on that day, I received uh, a lot of abuse and uh, was withdrawn from the operation. Two weeks later, 66 suspects were arrested and such was the evidence produced by the operation that 61 pleaded guilty and two more were found guilty. All were banned from every English football ground for five years. At Wolves, Superintendent Bob Morris believes the success of the operation has changed the whole atmosphere. If you have a look now at the Wolves Gate, it's gone to 16,000 on average. If you look at the number of arrests, the number of ejections, all those are lower. And probably the one thing that shows it is the fact that there is now a family enclosure and children and wives and girlfriends are coming to this ground. The success of Operation Growth has shown that targeting individuals can reduce large-scale violence. To discover more vital information about hooligans and their movements, Superintendent Adrian Appleby has been given the task of heading the newly formed National Intelligence Body, directly responsible to the Home Office. The National Football Intelligence Unit will coordinate information about hooligans and how they operate. And normally they like to call their leaders generals, and under the generals they have the, the, the troops, but within the troops they have various jobs given out, such as intelligence officer, transport manager, armourer, official photographer even. Most groups now have a, a photographer. They like to record the damage and the wounds they inflict on other people. So they actually go out and photograph, plan, organise in a military style, in a military fashion? Yes, I think they see their operation as a war game. But it's now become clear that covert operations must be conducted within a carefully structured and strict framework. Operation Own Goal was the unfortunate name for an undercover operation whose very title predicted its own demise. It was centred around a gang known as the Chelsea Headhunters. Undercover officers from the Metropolitan Police infiltrated the gang, leading to eight arrests. There followed similar operations at West Ham and Millwall, where 16 people were charged. But all are now free. The cases were either dismissed at court or on appeal because of concern about how the officers' statements were compiled. Chris Henderson and Stuart Glass were accused of being Chelsea headhunters. They faced charges of conspiracy to cause an affray and assault, 
but when their counsel questioned the evidence, the trials collapsed. At the time, I fitted uh, the stereotype from the media of your typical football hooligan. I had short hair, tattoos, overweight, and to the average policeman, or to the average person in the street, you know, I looked like a thug. So, I feel that's the reason why they targeted me. They'd follow me around everywhere, supposed to stand next to me in pubs, you know, stand on the periphery of a circle of people and overhear conversations, and then go and jot down certain bits of the conversation on programmes or bits of paper in the toilet, and then come back and listen to more conversation. I feel they made a decision about six or seven months before they set up their operation, and as far as they were concerned, I wasn't an innocent person they were going to follow to see if they could gather evidence. I was a guilty person and they were gathering evidence to prove that I was guilty. Scotland Yard declined to comment as Operation Own Goal is now being investigated by the Police Complaints Authority. Nevertheless, Superintendent Appleby still sees undercover operations as an essential part of a more sophisticated approach to dealing with hooligans. Obviously there has been some problems but there have been problems in other trials. I think the, the will in the police service to combat football hooliganism, hooliganism is as strong, or if not stronger, than it ever was. I'm sure we're now getting the tools together and the sophistication to combat it effectively, and I think that the legal structures are also going to assist us over time in that respect. But covert operations remain a high-risk strategy. They're time-consuming, expensive, and they can miss their target. Many senior police officers now believe the way forward is to be one step ahead of the hooligans, and that means more sophisticated intelligence gathered in a variety of ways. Villa Control 599, we are aware of the situation and have it in hand, over. Yes, they've got two shows going to set the complaints. All First Division clubs now have closed circuit television cameras, monitoring crowd movements towards and inside the grounds. At most high priority matches, police helicopters equipped with cameras are on duty. The Football Trust has spent three million pounds supplying specialist video equipment for police use. This officer observes one section of the crowd more intent on inciting the opposing fans than watching the game itself. Then there are teams of officers known as spotters who work on the ground with video and photographic equipment. They're building up files on people who are believed to be hooligans and part of their job is to find them on match days. This team work at all Chelsea matches searching streets and pubs. They're looking for about 50 individuals. They find they build up a strange relationship with their targets who become increasingly familiar. I think it's the game that they're used to playing. As, lo as long as we feel we've done our job properly and they've seen us, then that's the end of their time. I don't really think any uh, more about it. I'm certainly uh, surprised how friendly we almost are. Gathering intelligence is seen as a crucial factor in the future strategy for dealing with hooligans. Intelligence tells us what is going to happen. It helps us predict, if you like, future actions of hooligans. If we can get our intelligence honed down to s such sophistication, the policing of football in this country will change radically. But while most observers agree We're that right radical change is necessary, not all are convinced that more sophisticated policing is the way to achieve it. Some fear it will only make the hooligans more sophisticated and call for more fundamental changes. Instead of viewing all fans as potential hooligans, they say the police should involve supporters much more closely. Only in that way can any long-term changes be made. I think police are beginning to communicate their intentions to, to supporters, but I think a great deal more needs to be done in that regard. And I think they would do well to not only communicate their intentions to spectators, but also to consult them because I think supporters and supporters groups are a rich fund of knowledge about football and it needs to be tapped. You cannot have a situation where people uh, come on Saturday afternoons and are confronted 
by, uh, by aggression all the time. There has to be some give and take between fans and police. And to a large extent, that does uh, apply. I think most policemen, especially policemen who are policing a ground all the time, every Saturday, they do appreciate the need for uh, decent relationships with fans. But not all are so optimistic that any lasting change can be achieved. People will always fight for football or in the pub. It's human nature, you know, I mean, it's just not a football thing, you know, I mean, it's just the way life is. Making inroads against soccer hooliganism can at times seem like an impossible task. Critics are many and cooperation from even the law-abiding fans is minimal. Any advances against the hardcore hooligans come as a result of painstaking and often dangerous work. Is the intelligence coming through to us, are Absolutely, yes. Uh, doing and the countdown to what is potentially the biggest flashpoint of all, the World Cup, goes on inexorably. The world will be watching the, how the English fans behave, and their behaviour will reflect on this country, so it concerns me greatly. What I am saying is that the only power, the only authority I have in Italy is to give their policing authorities intelligence and information and knowledge on how British hooligans behave and the best way they can, can combat it. Having done that, my hands are tied. The British police are determined to press ahead against the hooligan, but translating what they learn at home to the day-to-day -day policing of the World Cup is an assignment of a different order and they remain apprehensive about the challenge. If the slogans on these t-shirts are anything to go by, then the omens for Italy 1990 do not look good. The nightmare returns. But these are all part of the hype. The crucial question is, will the Italian authorities take on board the inside information that the National Football Intelligence Unit gives them? And what's more to the point, will they be able to use it? Turin, Juventus versus Verona. Italian police have their soccer hooligans too. These are not gentlemen from Verona, but 500 of Italy's most violent fans. Filming is risky. At the club's previous two matches, police had to use CS gas to break up street riots. Today, they're taking no chances. Like their British equivalents, the Italian police keep the fans moving and their presence is thick on the ground. But these policemen carry revolvers and rifles, and they're in no mood to stand any nonsense. The Italian way of policing soccer violence is to let the fans know that they step out of line at their peril. But because violence isn't organised in the way it is in Britain, there's little need for undercover operations. To the Italian police, all soccer hooligans are the same. They need uh, help from England. They need free, uh, help from uh, English uh, policemen and uh, intelligence men. In, 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 I think that the question is a political one. Uh, in other terms, um, the Italian police is proud of his organization, and I am not sure that they uh, call, uh, uh, are calling for, uh, for help from English police. Judge Francesco Palmer is the chief coordinator of security at the World Cup. As far as he's concerned, he welcomes help from England. The Italian police are quite prepared to adopt the advice of the English police in order to find the correct solution to these problems. Nevertheless, these problems will be on Italian territory. Therefore, the Italian police will, of course, maintain their autonomy. Some senior English policemen who have already talked to their Italian counterparts have returned expressing concern. Italians don't have one police force, but several, each jealously guarding its autonomy. These are the state police. When it comes to controlling a football match, they split the job 50-50 with one of the other forces, the Carabinieri. They literally split the ground down the middle, with the state police at one end and the Carabinieri at the other the English police fear it's a recipe for confusion. There's also concern that the Italian police may not fully grasp the kind of English hooligan they'll face, full of lager and national pride. 
John Williams has just completed a report for the Council of Europe on the 1988 European Championships. There is an association now between the, the patriotic fervour supporting the national side, uh, the importance of, of, of showing continentals what it is about Englishness that you find important, and for the English that appears to be uh, being willing to stand up for yourself, not running away in certain situations, uh, showing continental supporters that uh, the English can be can be tougher in certain situations. I can't say whether the strategy of the Italian police will be as sophisticated as that of the English police. Because, of course, football hooliganism in England is long-standing and has obviously been studied and analysed to a great extent in that country. The threat of violence overshadows what the publicists are selling as the greatest spectacle in football history. Its main objective is to give us a great show. And by us, we mean both the fans of the matches and the viewers watching at home. To ensure that Italia 90 is a showcase for football and not drunken hooligans, over a thousand police are expected to be on duty at all the key matches. But in the past, this kind of saturation policing has been seen by English fans as a confrontation waiting to happen. The Italian police, in my experience at least, have tended to, to wait for things to unfold, wait for, for, for incidents to develop and then move in and uh, seem to be as, as interested in, in punishing the offenders as actually preventing the thing starting. Now, if, if the Italian police uh, adopt that kind of strategy, then I think we may be in danger of, of seeing what might be actually quite small problems escalating. The Italian police force is capable of showing great efficiency and has demonstrated in the past that it is both civil and democratic. But it has also had to deal with terrorists, who of course create much more difficult problems than football hooligans. But where are the Italian police going to come under greatest pressure? The National Football Intelligence Unit has told Public Eye that it expects around 8,000 ordinary English fans, plus 500 hooligans, to travel to Sardinia for the preliminary games. When England play Holland, around 4,000 Dutch supporters with 400 hooligans are expected to arrive on the island. There's an obvious potential for trouble. But the problems may be greater if England qualify and play on the mainland. Then, in the jargon of the terraces, the English fans may go steaming in. That's running amok. I think that quite possibly the main problems are going to occur when England go onto the mainland. Where they're going to play playing and who their opponents are is very much an unknown quantity. It's possible we could end up getting a team like Argentina. And when we get to that stage, tickets are going to be available. Very short notice, we could have major problems. We must not look at this problem in terms of being in a state of war. Indeed, we will not be arming the police as if they were about to fight a battle. However, if football fans in whatever numbers create disturbances, then the police will have to respond in the appropriate manner. There's no doubt that in England, in the wake of the Taylor report, there is an even greater political determination to tackle the problem of soccer violence and considerable progress has already been made. But Italy is a different question. This summer, the world will see not only the biggest spectacle in football history, but the biggest test ever in the battle against the football hooligan.